So I've been looking around in the wild to try and find myself a rare piece of gaming hardware. I've been looking around for the big jungle cat. The Atari Jaguar. The thing is a rare beast to find. There's only about a quarter of a million in the wild. So hunting it down was one of my top priority. And now I'm gonna be able to show you guys all about it. The video, this is a review. It's gonna be split up into two parts. The first of which is looking at the history behind the big cat itself. And the second, we'll be looking at more of the games. Some games you'd want to get and recommended titles and ones to avoid as well because that's always something key with this system. But without further ado, let's let the cat loose and find out about the Jag. The system begins life in Wales in 1989. Here, joystick company Conix were a local success story, producing accessories and controllers for some of the most popular 8-bit home computers of the time, including the ZX Spectrum and the Commodore 64. But they had big plans, and they wanted to make a European gaming system. This would become the Conix Multi-System, and Conix commissioned Flare Technology, who were based in Cambridge and formed by ex Flare employees, to make the hardware. But sadly, the funds dried up and the system faded. Atari, however, were interested in Flare's work. They were so impressed, they decided to hire them to make their new hardware, and Flare agreed. The team worked on two systems, both the 32-bit Stillborn Panther and the, obviously the more famous Jaguar, which they quickly moved on to in 1992 as work was going much faster on the Jaguar machine. However, it seems a little bit rushed as the Panther was pretty much ready for launch, yet Atari gave the deadline of late 1993 for launching a test market to New York, San Francisco and London. This launch initially looked pretty good, sales went well, and stateside the launch went national in early 1994, whilst we here had to wait for the late 94 release. However, here where the problem really began. Only 20,000 units were provided for the UK launch proper, but UK marketing manager Daryl Still reckoned he could have sold 20 times what he got, which worked out a massive 400,000 systems. And it's a real shame that Atari just didn't have the funds to do this, because the Jaguar had some really potential, especially in places here like the UK. I mean, UK marketing manager Daryl Still reckons he could have sold 20 times the amount of units he was given to launch, which would have worked out a whopping 400,000 units. And that's a real boost for the Jaguar. But it's just a shame they couldn't do that. Maybe I'm being a bit biased, but I think they should have focused more on you know, the UK rather than places like America. Because here, we didn't have the same sort of apathy for the Atari brand that places like America did. We were still supporters and we wanted some of Jaguar. We had a better launch as well. We were selling around, you know, the games like Doom, we had Tempest 2000, Alien vs Predator. These were all coming out when the UK uh, launch was going on. So it would have been really, really good if they focused on it a bit more here. But I guess it's all in the past now and there's nothing we can change. The Jaguar hardware is something that often comes under flack as many people claim it wasn't 64 bits. I reckon they're just a bit jealous, you know, having like all their cruddy 32-bit PlayStations and Saturns and 3DOs and all. But I will use my techie knowledge here to unearth really what really goes on underneath that sleek black exterior. Well, it has a 32-bit CPU and a 32-bit GPU. However, it does have a 64-bit object processor and a 64-bit litter chip which is a really fancy Atari way of saying co-processor, which I guess is pretty fancy in itself. The Jaguar looks really sleek, curvy and, well, sexy, and with that blazing blood red Jaguar logo on the front, you won't confuse this with anything else. And I know everyone bitches about the cartridge port having but no cover, but the Jaguar just doesn't need one. I've had three connection issues with the Jaguar ever, Whereas my cartridge and port any on my N64 has three every time I change the game. Mind you, that's not really surprising. I guess it is a Nintendo after all. A lot of people moan about the cartridge themselves too, you know, saying they don't need a stupid handle. But it's for pushing, not for pulling. Notice how it fits into the palm of your hand? Exactly. Finally, the ever picked on controller. Again, everyone moans about this, but it fits well in your hand and it has some really nice buttons. 
and you know everyone's main complaint seems to be the keypad but it's not there for the main stuff in this game that's what the big red buttons are for in fact now I think about it the console seems to get picked on a lot almost like a small kid at school will always pick last for the game of football in the playground but underneath that exterior is raw, undiluted 64-bit power. And there's no denying how powerful it is. And I guess it's not for everyone. Only a few of us, you know, braced, hardened and ready retro gamers can harness its power, use it for our own retro entertainment. And it's almost scary how much power this big cat has. Tune in for part two and you'll see some of the really awesome games that gave the Jaguar a 64-bit bite. You've been warned. Thank <laughs> you.